Hey boot campers, welcome back to another video. This is the beginning of the intestinal pathology chapter, and today we're going to be starting out by talking about celiac disease. After that, we're going to move into lactose intolerance, and we're going to follow that up with a short discussion about infectious malabsorption. If you want to check out more about those, you should go to our microbiology section. Irritable bowel syndrome is going to be our next video, followed by intussusception and then carcinoid tumors. And then we are going to move into zoliger ellison syndrome and follow that up with a discussion about different types of small bowel obstruction before we end the chapter with appendicitis. Now let's get into celiac disease. So what is celiac disease? It's kind of become a popularized thing for people to discuss having celiac disease or being gluten sensitive. However, real celiac disease is a pretty serious condition and people with celiac disease really can't tolerate any forms of gluten. And gluten comes in a surprising amount of things. Wheat and grain products are the origin for gluten and that's going to include anything from bread to also soy sauce. Now gluten itself is a protein and there's a portion of gluten known as gliadin, which is a peptide chain of the larger protein. And gliadin is what our sensitivity is really going to be oriented around. So gliadin is absorbed by enterocytes, and then after it's absorbed by our enterocytes right around here, it's going to move into our lamina propria, which is this layer beneath. And then once it's inside of our lamina propria, it's going to be absorbed by macrophages. And this macrophage absorption is going to start the chain that ultimately leads to celiac disease. Remember, macrophages are one of our antigen presenting cells. And so once these macrophages have absorbed the gliadin, they're then going to present a deamidated version of gliadin to our CD4 plus T cells. And a discussion about antigen presenting cells wouldn't be complete without us mentioning the HLA subtypes for which this is going to be more common. And for celiac disease, these HLA subtypes are pretty high yield. You could certainly see these come up in test questions. HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8, which are both MHC type 2, meaning that they're only relevant for antigen presenting cells, are going to be our subtypes right here. So HLA-DQ2, HLA-DQ8 are our subtypes for celiac disease. And I like to remember these HLA subtypes by remembering the mnemonic people with celiac disease eight, so hate, two, eat, at Dairy Queen, which is the DQ. Now, this is of course relevant because Dairy Queen has a lot of gluten-containing products, but also it's a very helpful mnemonic for being able to remember the Dairy Queen DQ portion, as well as eight and two. Once those CD4 cells have received that deaminated gliadin from the macrophages, these T cells are then going to mediate the destruction of our small bowels villi. And they're gonna do this in part by releasing cytokines that are gonna bring a whole bunch of inflammation to the area. The major cytokines that you need to know for this are going to be TNF as well as interferon gamma. And then once our T cells have started this cascade of bringing inflammatory cells to the area, they're also gonna get our B cells to make antibodies. And these antibodies are not only going to be to gliadin, but also to tissue transglutaminase. And it's these antibodies towards tissue transglutaminase that are gonna cause a lot of our problems. Now, why does the body make antibodies towards tissue transglutaminase? Well, going back to when we said that our gliadin is going to enter into our lamina propria, once our gliadin is inside of our lamina propria, it's deamidated by tissue transglutaminase. And so tissue transglutaminase is going to be cross-linked to gliadin. And thus, when B cells recognize that tissue transglutaminase is cross-linked to gliadin, those B cells are then going to make antibodies towards tissue transglutaminase as well as gliadin. So now that we've discussed the pathophysiology, how does celiac disease actually present? Well, it's going to present most notably with chronic steatorrhea and bloating. And again, steatorrhea is a form of diarrhea that's going to be very fat-heavy. It's fatty diarrhea. In children, celiac disease can also present with failure to thrive. However, I do want to point out that this is more of an adult disease than it is a pediatric disease. Now, a lot of the time when we talk about chronic steatorrhea and malabsorption, we're typically talking about our terminal ileum. And this might bring you back to Crohn's disease, which classically affects the terminal ileum and of course comes with a lot of malabsorption symptoms. However, celiac disease is not primarily a disease of our ileum. Celiac disease primarily affects our distal duodenum as well as our proximal jejunum. Now, this is gonna result in malabsorption as well. However, it's important to recognize that it's not the ileum that is the primary target in celiac disease. 
And because of the damage to our distal duodenum and our proximal jejunum, this malabsorption is not only going to impact our ability to absorb fat-soluble vitamins, it's also going to reduce our ability to absorb iron. Iron is primarily absorbed in these regions of the small intestine, and thus patients with celiac disease can also have iron deficiency, which can present as iron deficiency anemia, and thus fatigue. So these patients can be very fatigued and they can also have weight loss, which comes along not only with the malabsorption, but also a feeling of discomfort associated with eating. A really important extra intestinal manifestation of celiac disease that you need to keep in mind is dermatitis herpetiformis. Now, dermatitis herpetiformis has nothing to do with herpes. It's just named that because the lesions that appear resemble herpes, hence the name herpetiformis. But what's really happening here is a deposition of IgA autoantibodies on our dermal papillae. And the reason that these dermal papillae are going to have these IgA depositions is because of the presence of tissue transglutaminase at those dermal papillae. And so our anti-gliadin IgA antibodies are going to cross-react with the transglutaminase at these dermal papillae and thus cause inflammation to come to the area because we've essentially said to our body, hey, we're putting a bunch of antibodies on these dermal papillae. You need to send inflammatory cells to figure out what's going on. And that is going to look like this. This is a great example of dermatitis herpetiformis and is a classic picture that you might see on your NBME exam if the examiners are trying to prompt you to think about celiac disease. Because a lot of our gastrointestinal diseases, including things like tropical sprue, are not going to have these dermal manifestations. Lactose intolerance, for example, doesn't present with dermal manifestations like that. Tropical sprue doesn't present with dermal manifestations. And this dermatitis herpetiformis is such a unique finding to celiac disease that it's going to be a great way for examiners to bring you into thinking about celiac disease without giving you too much information about the gastrointestinal manifestations. Now, celiac disease itself is not only unfortunate and not fun for patients at all, but it's also going to increase our risk for other conditions. This can include small bowel carcinoma, as well as enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma, or EDL. Going back to our fat-soluble vitamin malabsorption, we're also going to have an increased risk for osteoporosis with celiac disease. Now, the diagnostics and management are really important for celiac disease because the disease itself can present somewhat vaguely at times. You have a patient, let's say, who comes into the clinic with bloating and they're having diarrhea. The patient's not going to know to describe that diarrhea as steatorrhea, but they may describe it as floating diarrhea or yellowish diarrhea. And then you check the patient's labs and you see that they have an iron deficiency. Now, immediately, this shouldn't lead you down the path of celiac disease. And your examiners may not do something so kind as to present you with this rash. And in the case that they do present you with this rash, they would likely describe it as erythematous because of its redness, as well as papular and containing either pustules, which are, of course, pus-filled, or vesicular in nature. And so if you aren't given extra presentation information in a vignette, if they're not bringing to mind the fact that all of this is diet associated, what they may do instead is give you some form of diagnostic histology. And our histology in this case is fairly unique. For one thing, celiac disease causes villus atrophy. And you can see a phenomenal example of villus atrophy right up here. So normally we would see with these villi some real spikes, right? Our villi normally jut out because these are trying to provide more space in our intestines. But you can see right here, this villi is unbelievably capped. So it normally would leap out into the lumen of the small intestine. But right here we have our lumen and we can see this villi is barely even poking out at all. We can also see some crypt hyperplasia. And so if you look down here, you can see that this crypt hyperplasia is fairly evident. And this prolific formation of crypts is also going to come along with a bunch of intraepithelial lymphocytes. So if we look over here at our epithelium, we can see that it's very full of these inflammatory cells. And this inflammatory cell presence within our epithelium is really going to point us towards celiac disease. So if you see this combination of crypt hyperplasia, villus atrophy, and intraepithelial lymphocytes, these are all fairly evident on histology and should really point you towards celiac disease. But let's say they don't give you histology either. Well, we have some more cards up our sleeve. One of these is going to be an abnormal D-xylose test. 
We've talked about the D-Xylose test a lot in other videos, but for the most part, we've talked about it being normal. However, celiac disease is a perfect example of when our D-Xylose test is going to be abnormal because our D-Xylose test is testing for either mucosal damage or bacterial overgrowth inside of our intestine. And so, with our celiac disease, we have a whole bunch of mucosal damage, right? The disease itself is this inflammation and atrophy of our GI mucosa, right? And so all of this mucosa being injured is going to make our d -xylose test abnormal. Well, that means that we're gonna have a decreased urinary excretion of d -xylose because d -xylose is now unable to be absorbed through our damaged mucosa, and thus it's not going to enter into the bloodstream, and thus it's not going to be in our urine. We're instead going to have an increased stool excretion of our d -xylose. So the abnormal d -xylose test should point you towards celiac disease. Another incredibly high yield point about celiac disease is going to be our autoantibodies. These are something that can be tested for and these will come up in a vignette. So you can see a patient with IgA autoantibodies against tissue transglutaminase and gliadin, as we mentioned, as well as endomesium. And these endomesium antibodies are really just our tissue transglutaminase antibodies by another name. And to further this high yield point, IgA, as we know, is not our most present immunoglobulin by far, right? IgG is. And so, when we have all these IgA autoantibodies being produced, patients can develop an IgA deficiency. And in fact, IgA deficiency is common amongst people with celiac disease because IgA is being so commonly used by the body to attack itself as well as gliadin. And because of this, we can have an IgA deficiency and thus IgG autoantibodies towards a lot of these things we've just been discussing. Now, how might this come up in a vignette? Well, a patient can be given IgA or an IgA-containing blood product and have an allergic reaction to it because they are IgA deficient. IgA deficiency resulting in this reaction to IgA being provided to someone is a very tricky but common way for examiners to sneak in celiac disease and make you think of the bigger picture of how your immune system works in combination with your GI system. Now finally, let's get into the management of this condition. The management is simply a gluten-free diet. Now, I included diagnostics and management in the same section here because this is also how you test for celiac disease sometimes. Right? If somebody comes in and you believe they may have celiac disease and you say to yourself, okay, look, we could do some histology testing, we could do a d -xylose test on you, but the treatment and a really reliable test are gonna be the same thing, which is getting rid of gluten. And so a gluten-free diet is going to resolve the symptoms of celiac disease. However, patients can, of course, still have flares, and it's very difficult to entirely remove gluten from your diet, so keep that in mind in a real clinical scenario. A final thing to mention is going to be Dapsone. Dapsone is going to be used to treat dermatitis herpetiformis, and Dapsone, interestingly, is not only used to treat dermatitis herpetiformis and celiac disease, it's also used to treat leprosy. So before we end this video on celiac disease, let's very briefly do a recap. So celiac disease is a disease that occurs when patients consume wheat and grain products, because these wheat and grain products contain gluten, which contains gliadin. And this gliadin is going to be processed by tissue transglutaminase, and this deaminated gliadin is then absorbed by macrophages and it's then presented to CD4 positive T cells. Those CD4 positive T cells are then going to bring inflammation to the area via interferon gamma and TNF and then B cells are going to make antibodies towards not only that gliadin but also towards tissue transglutaminase. That's going to present with a patient who comes in feeling unwell, fatigued, bloating, having chronic steatorrhea, as well as symptoms of fat-soluble vitamin and iron deficiency. The patient might also present with a papular, pustular, and vesicular erythematous rash, and this rash right here is dermatitis herpetiformis. And a common place for this dermatitis herpetiformis to occur is extensor surfaces such as our elbows. Celiac disease has some very unique diagnostic findings, including villus atrophy, which is very evident right here inside of our distal duodenum as well as our proximal jejunum. And this villus atrophy is going to be present alongside crypt hyperplasia as well as intraepithelial lymphocytes. Celiac disease is a mucosal damaging disease, and as such, it's going to result in a positive D-xylose test, 
and it's very important to remember that IgA autoantibodies against tissue transglutaminase gliadin and endomesium are going to be present. However, it's common for patients to have an IgA deficiency, and as such, IgG autoantibodies will be present, and you can look out for this by seeing if somebody with celiac disease has a reaction to IgA-containing products. Finally, the treatment for celiac disease is going to be a gluten-free diet, as well as Dapsone for the dermatitis herpetiformis. That's been it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.